Hello and welcome to The Sidebar, presented by True Crime Daily, taking you inside the courtrooms of high-profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense lawyer based in Los Angeles and previously an L.A. County prosecutor for nearly a decade. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ or at JoshuaRitter.com. We are recording this on Friday, January 12th, 2024. In this week's episode, the man accused in the deadly robbery of a drug den known as the Treehouse has opted to represent himself as trial gets underway. We also look at a Massachusetts judge placing highly anticipated court documents under seal leading to further public speculation of a cover-up in the case of a Boston woman charged with the murder of her police officer boyfriend. But first, a shocking turn in the so-called pizza delivery murder, as an entire new jury must be selected after the revelation that previous jurors researched and discussed the case. Today, we are very excited to be joined by Dina Dahl, a attorney, legal analyst, and commentator you can catch on Court TV and News Nation, and a friend of the show. Dina, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Uh, I've been looking forward to this because I know you follow these cases closely. I watch you uh, when you appear on TV, and I always really appreciate your comments. Um, and there's some new ones for us, so stuff that we haven't talked about so much, stuff that's in the news but hasn't been uh, something on our radar. And so we're, we're going to get into these cases a little bit for the first time. The first one is out of Summit County, Ohio, where new jurors will be brought in for the retrial of a woman charged in the, quote, pizza delivery murder of an Army veteran. This development comes after defense attorneys for Erica Stefanko discovered that the first pool of jurors had researched and discussed the case leading to concerns that the jury could not be objective in the retrial. Stefanko is accused of luring Army veteran and Domino's pizza delivery driver Ashley Biggs to her death in 2012 with a bogus pizza order. Biggs, the former girlfriend of Stefanko's then-husband Chad Cobb, was in a custody dispute with Cobb regarding the former couple's seven-year-old daughter. After Biggs was lured to the location, Cobb tased the woman before beating and strangling her. Following the murder, Stefanko allegedly accompanied Cobb as he disposed of the body and destroyed evidence in the killing. Stefanko was convicted in a November 2020 trial. However, that conviction was overturned with an appellate court ruling that testimony from her ex-husband Cobb, who was in custody, given during COVID restrictions, should not have been allowed to be conducted via video. Cobb pled guilty for his role in the murder and is currently serving a life sentence and is expected that he will again testify in this retrial. The new jurors in Stefanko's retrial will be given strict instructions prohibiting discussing and researching the case, going as far as to say conversations between jurors will be limited to sports and weather. The retrial is slated to begin opening statements the day you are listening to this podcast. All right, Dina, a lot to digest in this case. But the first thing I wanted to talk to you about is this idea of being granted a retrial, essentially because the first trial was conducted under COVID restrictions with her ex-husband uh, being allowed to testify remotely. And my question is, this isn't the only case where trial was conducted under COVID restrictions. I myself, uh, I did a trial that was entirely remote. And I also uh, argued a hearing uh, in front of an appellate court as I sat in my office and they were across the country. And so I'm saying a lot of people were practicing under these bizarre kind of conditions. And I'm curious, do you think this is the beginning of kind of a flood of these appeals based on those circumstances? Yeah, this case is just one of the reasons why we love following true crime, right? There's so many twists and turns. Yeah. It's never boring. It's great to be on your show again. I could talk about these things all day with you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yet again, COVID. I mean, we all were watching. We were analyzing these cases in real time. I mean, I analyzed this case as it was happening, you know, November 2020. And I remember that was a comment a lot of us made was like, how is this going to affect the outcomes? Because it was novel, right? This idea of remote and them wearing masks. 
um, you know, w- there was this sense of like, was this going to interfere with the defendant's constitutional right to confront their witnesses? And essentially what the Court of Appeals said was it was a little bit of a narrow ruling, let's say, is they didn't say by nature, the fact that it was remote, the fact that they were ma- wearing masks made it a violation of her fifth, sixth and 14th amendments. That's what they said. It was a violation of her due process and a right to confront uh, her witnesses. But they didn't say just um, because of that. They really did uh, allude to the fact that different jurisdictions, a lot of jurisdictions have already been looking into this and have found different things. But the requirement was that there be exceptional circumstances to overcome this really important constitutional right by the defendant. I mean, you can understand it, right? Because when we were watching this and when you see it, when somebody's on video and uh, wearing a mask, it's really hard to tell the person's expression, right? Like if you're a good defense attorney and you've just caught them in a lie, um, you're really only seeing the person's eyes. You're losing a lot of um, the like uh, the impact let's say, of that. And so you can see why that would be kind of a watered down version of a confrontation of witness or even being remote, like the person's not right there next to the jury box. The jury can't, um, you know, completely see maybe they're like twitching their fingers in a way that makes them, you know, I mean, you just you don't get the big picture. So you can kind of like logically see why that would be um, harming, let's say, the defense right. but And the Court of Appeals is, was basically saying it's not like you can never do that. But what the judge didn't do in this case, and I know as you're an attorney, you you understand this, it's basically like preserve the record. Um, there's a reason why when we watch our all these trials and a lot of your reviewers who watch those trials, you know, you see so many objections and the judge uh, has these many hearings, flushing out objections before they make rulings, really to put all of the objections and the kind of, let's say, um, reasonings around it on the record to preserve the issue for appeal. So when the appellate court looks at it, they can look how that issue was handled. And the court basically said that the judge didn't say, you know, there. Uh, one of the witnesses was also that like a man, the manager of the pizza place. And the judge didn't say why that person couldn't travel from out of state. He just said the person couldn't travel from out of state. He didn't say that they were maybe more susceptible to COVID because of health reasons or anything like that. And same with the argument about Cobbs being in prison. The judge didn't really go into kind of why they did mention there was like a difficulty with the quarantine period, but again, didn't really talk about why it was particularly difficult for these particular witnesses to appear in public during COVID-19. And that kind of failing of flush, flushing that out and kind of justify why you are going to maybe harm a little bit uh, this defendant's right is the reason why it was overturned. So I don't know if we're necessarily going to see a flood of overturning um, convictions in this, but if the judges in those particular trials didn't do these things and really justify um, or like, you know, bring out the reasonings or the facts of why this was an exceptional, you know, it would have to have been an exceptional um, reason that they couldn't appear even during COVID-19, you know, that's when we're going to see overturns like this. Yeah. Yeah. Really well put. And it demonstrates, I think, two super important points for viewers and listeners to understand and people who, who watch these trials avidly many times, and I'll see this and it'll frustrate me, a um, defense attorneys, especially will make some sort of objection and people will criticize it. Like that's a ridiculous objection. Oh, oh, he got overruled. And they view it as though it's all about, uh, you know, like scoring points like, oh, he, he, he missed that layup. Therefore, he looks it, it, it's an embarrassing moment for that attorney. But what they don't understand is how important it is what you're talking about preserving the record. Many times they're making these objections or making these motions, knowing they're going to be shut down by the judge. But if they don't make it, if they don't make that objection and they don't raise that issue, they cannot raise it on appeal. 
And so they're preserving the record, like you said. And this is a lot of what's taking place behind the scenes in these trials and why you see b- attorneys behaving certain ways and making certain certain uh, motions and objections. And this is exactly why, because if these things aren't uh, preserved, it can create problems later on. Like you're pointing out, that's amazing to me. I was not aware that that was the issue that the appellate court focused in on was the idea that they didn't. They didn't properly explain why it was these people had to be remote. The other part I'll say is I could not agree more that during this time, it was to me beyond frustrating to the point that I do feel it was rubbing up against people's constitutional rights to expect the cross-examination could be could take place through a mask. And you're absolutely right. Somebody, especially if the witness is up there on the stand wearing a mask, how in the world, and this is an instruction given to jurors, that they're supposed to assess someone's credibility and trustworthiness and veracity. And how do you do that if you can't even see their face? And they talk about things like someone's demeanor and their uh, facial expressions and their body language. How do you do that if somebody's sitting behind a mask? Add to that that it's being done through a video screen and you've got the attorney wearing a mask, the person on video wearing a mask, and it's being conducted on video. The whole thing, I remember, you know, when we were preparing for this, I watched some more of that footage and it's just difficult to watch because of how difficult it was for those attorneys to get through it. And it does not have the same impact. And trials are not theater, but they also are. And a lot of this is about creating a rhythm and having the ability to have a, a, a witness sweat on the stand and the jurors being able to perceive that and understand that and all those little nuance that's a part of human communication that doesn't really translate through a video sc- screen and through a mask. So fascinating stuff. I think you might be right. Uh, maybe they maybe they constructed this um, narrowly enough that they're not going to open up floodgates here, but I would not be surprised if we don't see other cases that try to challenge this. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about on this case is the idea that they threw out an entire jury panel because they researched the case, which is, as a trial attorney, I can imagine you share the same frustration that I have about all of this, because how many times are they instructed by the judge don't discuss this case. Don't research this case. If you see news on this case, please avoid it. But it sounds like here they took it upon themselves to research it and to discuss it. And they end up getting the entire jury panel uh, thrown out and they have to start all over again. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't be funny, but it's kind of hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> Because yeah. they didn't just talk about it. They researched like they this was, um, you know, like a um, a plus students, let's say jury panel. And um, and it sounds like the problem was it was so early on. It sounds like they were still just in a question answering the questionnaire stage and they hadn't been like formally admonished yet by the judge. And they just were. And it sounds like they were uh, a problem also was that they weren't brought into like the courtroom. Um, There was something about like next time they will be there. But there was some issue. Maybe I don't know if it was like construction or something. So it sounds like they were kind of like in a different space, kind of left alone a little bit with these questionnaires. And, you know, everybody has cell phones these days and they were just, hey, let's let's do our thing. And um it is pretty shocking, though, um, that they um, kind of went that far. And considering the fact that this was already televised, uh, you would think they would have. I mean, the the, um, the people in charge, right, like the judges and the lawyers, would have um, expected some of this and would have kind of included an admonishment and instructions to the jury, like right away. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, it, 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 having done this so many times, it's flabbergasting to me that something like you expect the people, you know, they can't avoid maybe on a really high profile case, they run across an article, they try to avoid it, but for them to like proactively go about trying to research this. And, and the reason for that is not about treating jurors like children. It, it's about that there's a lot of information out there that might not be true. There's a lot being reported that they don't have 
access and it's not reporters trying to be um, untruthful, but they just don't have access to all of the evidence and understanding how things are actually going to develop. And you could easily prejudice some of these people if they run across some bad information or 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 information that is that is going to be challenged somehow and not come out in court. And so, yeah, there's it, it frustrating, but I'm glad that they were able to catch it now rather than go through the whole trial and find out about it. And then it tosses this uh, case and we're looking at a third retrial of it. In any case, we will continue to watch that case. Uh, like we said, it is it is ongoing and we will keep you all updated. A new year always comes with new resolutions. So get a kickstart on your goals with Factor. Factor's ready to eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success. Skip the grocery stores, the prep work, and the cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie, and more, you will have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart those resolutions. Factors, no prep, no mess meals frees up time that you'd otherwise have to spend shopping, cooking, and cleaning up. Plus, Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, and snacks. Another thing I love, Factor is flexible. You can change your order up every week with plans from four to 18 meals per week or pause or reschedule your deliveries at any time. Head to factormeals.com slash truecrime50 and use the code truecrime50 to get 50% off. That's a lot. That's code truecrime50 at factormeals.com slash truecrime50 to get 50% off. Let's move to Key West, Florida, where trial is underway for Franklin Tucker, the man accused in what has now been dubbed the Treehouse Murder. In a move that was surprising to many, Tucker has opted to represent himself against charges of a robbery turned fatal. Prosecutors claim that Tucker and an accomplice, Rory Wilson, wore masks and brandished a knife in an attempt to rob a known drug resident dubbed the Treehouse. According to reports, when Tucker and Wilson entered the Treehouse, they encountered a man and a woman whom they held at knife point. A third victim, Matthew Bonet, then encountered the burglars who violently attacked Bonet, stabbing him multiple times, resulting in his death. Wilson was convicted of first-degree murder and robbery with a deadly weapon in December of 2022, while a third co-conspirator, Travis Johnson, pleaded guilty to being the getaway driver. Johnson later testified against Wilson and is expected to do the same against Tucker. Tucker is the last of the alleged co-conspirators to face trial in the fatal robbery that netted a mere $250 and will represent himself after a, quote, breakdown in communication between Tucker and his lawyers. In his opening statements, Tucker maintained he is innocent and alleged that authorities manufactured evidence in order to build a case against him. Um, Dina, I don't know if you've ever run across this or had to deal with it, but pro per defendants, uh, and what we mean by that is people representing themselves, people who have chosen to represent themselves at trial. You have a right to do that. You have a right to have a counsel appointed to you if you can't afford one, but you also have a right to represent yourself. And oftentimes these are nightmares for judges and prosecutors. We saw this recently in the trial of Daryl Brooks, who represented himself in that Christmas parade massacre that left six people dead in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And we remember what a circus at times it was dealing with him. Um, Do you think this will lead to problems in this case and worse yet, possible uh, appealable issues? I really remember that Daryl Brooks case. Uh, It was a circus for sure. And you do wonder whether or not in this day and age when so many trials are televised, uh, how much that goes into the decision to represent himself in this situation where it's um, likely to be televised because his co-conspirator, as you say, was convicted in 2022. His um, so his chances aren't very good, let's say, of being acquitted. And if and if you're in that spot, you might say, hey, I'll, I let me get 
go out with a bang, so to speak, and, and get the limelight and all that kind of stuff. So I do imagine this is going to be a circus again, especially because of his argument, right? His argument that this is all manufactured. This is a big conspiracy. Again, two of his co-conspirators, you know, they already have, um, you know, or, you know, either plead guilty or convicted. So the, there's the evidence is solid, let's say, right? We know that the evidence is solid. It's already been tested by a jury. So this seems like a fabrication on his part that there's some sort of conspiracy. And he's going to try to introduce that argument throughout the trial. And he's going to try to discredit the judge because, um, you know, that judge is going to be part of the conspiracy and all of that. And so I imagine it will for sure be a circus, um, which you would think would backfire. Uh, juries don't want to waste their time. You know, they don't want to be there. They have jobs and lives. And and so they don't like the idea of somebody kind of wasting their time. So you would think it would backfire. It is in Florida. Florida cases tend to kind of sometimes come out in a way we don't think. And in Key West, maybe there will be jurors on there who um, do believe in government conspiracies and might buy into his argument a little bit more than, let's say, um, a different jurisdiction. But, you know, it's it's obviously going to be an uphill battle for him. He probably won't make it, but it will probably be entertaining for us to watch. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I agree with you. I, do, I, I, It'll be entertaining, but I think it does not bode well that he has decided to represent himself in a case of this seriousness. My experience is that most, not all, but most of the people who do, decide to represent themselves, that says a lot about their personality. And it's usually someone who, you know, leans towards the narcissistic, believing that no one can do a better job than them. And I think you're right. I think a lot of it just has to do with, hey, I'm going to have my day in court and be able to say what I want to say. There was a breakdown between him and his an attorney, probably over the things he wanted that attorney to argue in court, uh, some of which we're getting a, a preview of where he's gone as far as to label the judge in this case, a criminal involved in a much larger criminal enterprise. So everybody's in on it as far as he's concerned. And I think you're right. I, I don't see any of this uh, playing out uh, it to his benefit. But then, I mean, Add to all of this, the linchpin in this case seems to be that testimony from the getaway driver. I mean, is there anything even an attorney could do to to get around that kind of testimony when a convicted co-conspirator is going to say exactly what went down? Probably not. And, and you know, that's why we saw um, the other co-conspirator, um, you know, Wilson, get a conviction, you know, because that is very strong evidence. And if there was even any exculpatory evidence out there. I'm sure he would be talking about it. So we're not hearing that. Uh, so I think that is probably impossible to overcome at his point. And, and so I do think he, he's, he just wants to like say his thing, but it never makes sense for anybody to, I mean, the law, practice of law is difficult. Rules of law are difficult. Rules of evidence are difficult. Uh, so he's certainly putting himself at a disadvantage, but, he probably doesn't care. He probably uh, wants to say his piece. And if he truly believes that there's some sort of criminal conspiracy everywhere, uh, maybe he, you know, that's the only th person he can trust is himself, so to speak. And, and he has that right. Like you said, he has that constitutional right to um, not trust anybody else and say it for himself, even if it doesn't help him. Uh, you don't always have to make decisions in this country that are, let's say, good for you. And I think that's what we see. No, there is no constitutional guarantee to save yourself from being stupid, I guess, is, is the way to put it. And he's he's that's he's well within his rights to do whatever he wants, even if that's going down uh, in flames. Um, again, another case we're going to keep our eyes on. Let's be real. Investing can be intimidating, so intimidating that sometimes it feels easier to just push it off. If you can identify with that, today's sponsor might be just the thing to kick you into gear. Today's episode is sponsored by Acorns. Acorns helps you automatically save and invest for your future. You don't need a lot of money to get started. You can even start by investing your spare change with Roundups. The app even gives you access to education and guidance to learn more about investing. 
Head to acorns.com slash true crime to sign up for acorns to start saving and investing for your future today. Investing involves risk, including the loss of principal. Please consider your objectives, risk tolerance, and acorns fees before investing. Acorns Advisors LLC is an SEC registered investment advisor. Brokerage services are provided to clients of Acorns by Acorns Securities LLC member FINRA SIPC. For more information, visit acorns.com. Finally, we move to Norfolk County, Massachusetts, where a judge has sealed a motion to dismiss the indictment against a woman accused of running over her police officer boyfriend in a case that defense attorneys are alleging is a massive cover up. Prosecutors allege that Karen Reed hit her boyfriend, Officer John O'Keefe, with her SUV before leaving the man to die in the freezing cold. Defense attorneys filed a motion on her behalf to dismiss the charges, claiming that Reed is the victim of a DA conspiracy and that prosecutors withheld information regarding a federal investigation into the case. The impoundment is their term or sealing of the motion is likely to fuel public speculation surrounding the death which has feverishly divided the Boston suburb ever since O'Keefe was found dead outside the home of another officer. Reed has received an inordinate outpouring of support from many in the community who believe O'Keefe was perhaps beaten or killed inside of the home before being left in the snow. Every court appearance for Reed has been a public spectacle, which is expected to continue at her next hearing scheduled for January 28th. This is a case that we've talked about a little bit before. We're kind of keeping our eyes on it, but I expect that it's going to really heat up in the new year and it's expected to go to trial, I think, in the next few months. We'll see if that actually happens. Dina, while while it's not entirely unheard of, um, defendants making this conspiracy contention are still rare. What do you think it was about this case that caused the defense to take that route? Because I'm just going to say it's risky. It may have high reward if the jurors buy it, but it's also very risky. Is is this simply a case where you feel like they just didn't have another viable defense? It's interesting that we're seeing two cases back to back that's basically yeah. making that argument that like the justice system is like conspiring against me. And you can't kind of ignore the like national conversation, let's say, about that, where there's a huge amount of mistrust in a lot of government institutions, um, including the justice system. And that kind of rhetoric is um, amplifying, let's say. And so, um, you know, the one in Florida, he seems like this is definitely, uh, you know, like Hail Mary type thing. Uh, This one, I think more will be revealed, let's say. It's a little bit early in the process. It sounds like the judge said that one of the reasons why he sealed the um, indictment or the the motion, the defense motion, was because there is a federal grand jury proceeding looking into the police investigation, which is interesting. Um, you know, why are they doing that? Is there like is there actually something there? Could she be right? Um, and, and then possibly then unsealing it afterwards. So the fact of sealing it um, is unusual. And like you said, it kind of leads into maybe this idea of secrecy. This grand jury proceeding is unusual in this kind of a case. I mean, honestly, the facts of this case are fascinating. Um, The whole thing (laughs) is fascinating. And, And it sounds like she's really getting like a rally of support there which is even more fascinating because um, you wouldn't think that Boston would be like a hub of a conspiracy theory support. So if there are people there who are coming in support of her theory, you again think maybe there is something there. And I think it's a good lesson for why um, it's always good not to completely discount Right. Um, it's arguments, because in, in one case, it can be completely outlandish. And in the other one, maybe it's true. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, this type of stuff happens um, in cases all the time. I mean, it, it is if the reason for sealing the documents is because there there's this ongoing federal grand jury investigation that that is not surprising. That would be a reason why the judge would seal it. And in 
many cases that would not even register as a blip on anybody's radar. But in this case, with this specter that the defense has created of conspiracy and cover up, it just kind of adds a little bit of fuel to that fire. I will say the thing that is most curious to me is why is there a federal grand jury investigation ongoing while this case is pending? You would think they would conclude the one before pursuing the other if they are related. But again, you know, grand jury proceedings are supposed to be secret for the most part. So we don't really know what they're investigating. But it is, again, in a case like this, when it's already got so much you know, uh, speculation and 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 um, drama surrounding it, it. It's understandable why people are kind of going nuts with every move that's made. Um, alongside that, the defense has been extremely aggressive and trying to get um, what they feel is necessary and relevant evidence in this case. And um, going as far as to request that the judge order individuals who were tangentially connected to the incident to turn over cell phones. And I, it, it, it presents the opportunity to kind of explain what are the obligations that a prosecution has when it comes to evidence that they have to turn over. Mm-hmm. So basically, they have to turn over evidence that they have. Evidence that is the custody and control of the prosecution and the law enforcement. Evidence that they collect and use in the evaluation of their trial, they have to turn over to the other side. It's kind of similar, actually, in a civil litigation. Also, you have to exchange evidence. Uh, You kind of have to be on the same page. And so the prosecution has to give the defense a chance to evaluate the evidence, be able to rebut the evidence, all that kind of stuff. In this situation, what they're as defense is essentially asking is for them to go collect evidence that they haven't yet collected, at least from what we know they haven't yet collected. And that's something the defense can't do. They can't direct the investigation of the prosecution um, and the law enforcement. If the prosecution, the law enforcement doesn't believe that there's a kind of um, basis, let's say, for a search warrant of that evidence, then they're not going to go look for it and collect it. And if they haven't collected it, there's by nature nothing to turn over. But uh, you, they are the defense is giving like a sneak peek, let's say, in what their argument is going to be if the prosecution and the law enforcement doesn't collect that cell phone data of that house. Because we know the defense is going to say... <laughs> They failed to investigate whether or not the people inside the home who is you know, part of law enforcement were involved in this. And why didn't they collect it? Is it because they were trying to cover it up? So to me, I think that they're actually giving the prosecution like a heads up. This is a big hole in your investigation. If you don't uh, follow through. You know, we've got a a great argument that we're going to be putting in front of the jury. So to to me, I would actually go ahead and do that. I would think that they would have a basis for a search warrant. If a dead body is literally found on your front yard, how can you not be investigated? And if they don't do that, I think that's going to be a great thing to put in front of the jury for the defense. Yeah. Yeah, you might be right. Yeah, it's, it, there's an important distinction, and you, you described it well, but the, what the prosecution cannot do is say, we have all of this evidence, but we're only going to use this fraction of it, and that's the only thing we're going to turn over. They're not allowed to do that. They're not allowed to decide what's important and not important to the defense. So if they have you know, boxes of evidence, they just have to turn it all over. But what they're not obliged to do, as you pointed out, is to go do the defense's bidding. And if the defense says, I want you to investigate these other people, they're not they're not under any kind of obligation to go do that. But the other flip side to that, as you point out, is if they don't do it, the defense can point that out, that their investigation was not thorough, that their investigation was myopic, that they only centered in on my client and they didn't focus on anybody else who should have been looked at as well. But a judge can also step in in that circumstance in what's called third party culpability and say, listen, if you have solid evidence to link someone to a crime that could have been a suspect and I'm going to make the decision whether or not you can present that to a jury, because what they don't want to have happen is the defense to come in with every harebrained 
you know, suspect that they can think of and throw all of that nonsense in front of a jury, wasting everyone's time and just confusing everyone. But they do run the risk, like you said, if the prosecution is a little forthcoming, if some of that is allowed in and there is an idea that, like you said, that's a good point. I mean, a search warrant or 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 at least an investigation to the people in that home where the dead body was found, you think would reach that threshold. So we'll see how this all plays out. It's one of those cases that's getting a lot of attention pre-trial because of kind of all of these um, – defense uh, aggressive tactics and arguments that have to been made in court. I imagine the prosecution team out there is having a lot of sleepless nights and headaches. Um, my last question on this, uh, Dina, though, is in these cases that have so much public interest and attention, especially locally, it seems to have really captured that Boston area. How do you think that plays out? Does that usually benefit the defense, hurt the defense? What do you do? You, maybe none at all either way. What do you think? I mean, we've especially with the televising of trials and of just true crime in general, even before they go to trial, it, it, courts deal with this all the time, right? We're high profile cases. Um, you know, sometimes I do think uh, changing the jurisdiction uh, it maybe makes sense, right? If if the if the interest, the public interest is maybe so localized um, to one jurisdiction, then perhaps moving it to like the next town over does help. Doesn't uh, it doesn't happen that often, right? Because of court resources, it's not good for the court. But um, if it's, you know, most of the most of the area doesn't really care, but just this one town cares, then it's a good reason to do it. But in general, most likely what we're going to see here is that moving it to the town over is not going to matter because that news has been kind of saturated with, you know, throughout uh, the community and the community over and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, that doesn't help. And then it's really in the voir dire, the questioning of the jury, um, you don't have to not know anything about the case. That is not the standard for having an impartial jury. It's can you set aside and 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 evaluate and make an opinion of the case based on what you've been presented at trial? Like that's the standard. You don't have to find a jury who's never heard of the case. That would like almost be impossible in most of these high profile high profile things. It's can you set aside what you've learned and make a decision based on the case? And and I do think that that's maybe not that hard because there's quite a bit of people who may have heard it, but don't actually have that vested of an interest um, that they can't set aside what they've even an opinion maybe that they've made or of hearing the case. Uh, so it's not impossible. And they do uh, get that out when they're asking a jury the questions. I mean, kind of like what we saw in the first case, they were able to figure out that the jurors had done their own research in the questioning. It elicited answers that made them realize that the jurors had done their independent research. So so it is effective. I know people always um, question that, like, how is that really possible that questioning the jury can create an impartial jury? But lawyers do this all the time um, and they're good at asking the kind of questions to elicit um, whether or not there's an opinions and, and the jurors can be honest about it, too. Most people don't want to sit for a jury. <laughs> and so if they, if they um, have an opinion, they they are usually not afraid of saying it um, yeah. because most people are like, hey, I'd rather get a jury service than sit on this jury. So it can be done and it is done all the time. Yeah, you, you'd be surprised at I, I've had the 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 honor and privilege of working on a, a few what I would consider very high profile cases, you know, cases that were in the news, making headlines daily, being, you know, cameras in courtroom type of stuff. And you would think to yourself, how in the world are we going to find people, 12 people from this community that don't have any opinions about this case? And you'd be surprised. There are people, we're in this world where we follow true crime or we follow court cases and we feel like it's very important. And there are other people out there who just, it's not on their radar and they just don't care. And and like the judge instructed that other jury, they're more concerned with sports and the weather and they don't really follow what's going on. And they may have heard of this 
because they can't avoid it, but they really don't have an opinion on it. And I agree with you. I, th- I don't think they're going to have a problem finding an impartial jury in that area. Where I think they're going to have their hands full is dealing with the the frenzy of outsiders and spectators surrounding it. Because apparently the last couple of times she's appeared in court, Karen Reed, uh, she's entered the courtroom to applause, which is just blows me over that that's not something, one, that the judge is going to really stamp down, but that that's kind of the the spectacle that this case has already created. And like I said, we're not even at trial, but we will continue to watch that case as well. In the meantime, that is our show for this week. Dina, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find out more about you? They can follow me on Ask Dina Doll across all social media platforms. Fantastic. And thank you again. I'm your host, Josh Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ or at JoshuaRitter.com. You can find our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD sidebar. And thank you for joining us at the True Crime Daily Sidebar. Sidebar.